position. Did he have a choice? If a Jew is in, in, in the presence of another Jew's life's in jeopardy, you have an obligation to save him. So you have no choice. That's your obligation. A Jew is not well and he has to eat on Yom Kippur. Because that's what the doctor, that's the doctor's order. It's a mitzvah to eat on Yom Kippur. You must eat. But you're supposed to fast? No, you're supposed to fast if it doesn't put your life in jeopardy. Put your life in jeopardy, you must eat. So if you see another Jew, God forbid his life is being compromised, you're obligated to interrupt your Torah study. So here, if he saved the whole Jewish people in its entirety, and the only way you're able to bring that about is by compromising your Torah, so that's what you do. But yet, it seems to be there's a valid basis for criticism to Mordechai, because he wasn't engaged to the same degree. So there's a word from one of the commentators of, 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 on Shulchan Aruch by the name of Rav Shabse Cohen, the Shach. He explains, in life, why does God give certain people certain situations and other people other situations? That that God put him in a position that his, despite his greatness in Torah, that Torah has to be compromised, that itself says that he wasn't worthy to be fully engaged, because factually he wasn't fully engaged any longer. Understand, certain people are given certain things. Let's say communal responsibilities. Other people are given different responsibilities. I'll give you, I'll tell you a story about Paul Reichman. Paul Reichman, he was known as Moshe Reichman, the, family, the Reichman family lived in Toronto. They were the wealthiest Orthodox family in the world. They gave every year, many years, $131 million to charity. That's what they gave every year. And Reichman, Paul Reichman, studied during World War II. He was in London, and maybe a little bit before the war, there was a yeshiva in London. It was called Schneider's Yeshiva. The one who founded the yeshiva's name was Rabbi Schneider, and he was there also. He was the head of the yeshiva. And he had a very close friend, his name was Moshe Sternbach, who came from Switzerland. And they both started yeshiva together. Moshe Sternbach is still alive today. He's a man touching 90. He's one of the leading decisors in Israel. A great Torah sage. Moshe, Moshe Reichen, poor Reichen, became, was a Tamil Chochem, of course, but he was a great businessman. But there were different class of being knowledgeable in Torah. Now, during the war, or pre the war, what was Moshe Rachman's responsibility? His responsibility was to go to the bakery early in the morning to make sure the students for breakfast had fresh bread. That was his responsibility. Moshe Sternbach, his responsibility was to wake up the students early. They should go study in the base Medrash. They should be engaged in Torah studies. So Moshe Rachman himself said himself, that if I would have maybe woken the boys to go study and he would have sent him to to buy to buy the get the fresh bread, he'd be Moshe Reichman and I'd be Moshe Sternbach. You understand? But, um, but because we had different roles, I turned out to be this wealthy businessman, despite that I gave tremendous charity, and I but I'm, I wasn't what he is. I mean, God puts you in places where you're supposed to be. But factually, you have no choice, it, it's one thing. But factually, it does reflect on the spirituality of that person that 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 Hashem denies you certain spiritual opportunities is a reflection on the person. Even though what you do is great and phenomenal. That's how the Shach explains this. So I asked the question, you know, many people have detractors. Moshe Rabbeinu had detractors. And Moshe Rabbeinu was the greatest who ever lived. And yet, when we read the Megillah, it says he only... He fell out of favor by a min minority of his colleagues, of his peers. Therefore what? He had detractors. But who said the opinion had any value? Right? Maybe he was doing the right thing. But yet, the, the Talmud has a, a takeaway here. We're able to extrapolate from this. So what I said was, who authored? Who's the author of the Megillah? You know, the author of Megillah is Mordechai and Esther. If it was a baseless claim, criticism, why is he even recording it? That that he records it is an indication there's a certain validity to it. Otherwise, he would, wouldn't have recorded it. 
Moshe, despite he had the detractors, but what happened to his detractors? The earth opened its mouth and swallowed him up. That was the end of his detractors. So the Torah confirms Moshe emes the Torah emes. Moshe is true and his Torah is authentic and cogent and everything else and beyond. Here, who, who said their opinion had any value? And he felt it had no value. It was, it was a baseless criticism. Why record it? That that he recorded is because there is a lesson to be drawn from that. There is a certain degree of validity to it. There's what to learn from it. So what is the value of Torah? Torah protects one from punishment. So this world I understand. What does it protect you? To give you greater opportunity to correct it some other way rather than being punished. But it says even in when a person goes to spirit, the spiritual purification, Gehenum, it minimizes the level of, of purging. But if you need a greater degree of purging, so you need the Gehenum. So how does the Torah protect you from that, from that purging? Unless you're fully, you're able to extract all that impurity, you're not where you should be. So how do we understand it? So now, this is the way, I, if you remember, I had mentioned something from Chaim Voloshana, it's already on a Kabbalistic level. We read in Pirkei Ovos, Mitzvah Goreres Mitzvah, Avera Goreres Avera. When one does a mitzvah, it engenders one to do another mitzvah. One sins, it engenders one to do another sin. It encourages one. So based on the Zohar, Rav Chaim Voloshan explains it this way. When one sins, it creates an impure force. That's what it does. It's like, you know, you have bacteria that unless you destroy it, it festers and even may grow into a strain which what, what some, it could have been dealt with, can't, you can't deal with it. And therefore, if you use, if you use an antibiotic, you have to take it, the full regimen because if you only address it partially, just to the contrary, it, it'll develop into a strain that even if now you want to use a full, the full regimen of that, you need a different level of bacteria, of, of antibiotic. It's not going to do, do it any longer. So when one sins, it creates an impure force. It's called a, a, a contaminated force. This force is something which has to be sustained. You created it, you have to sustain it. If this force, everything in, in existence has to be sustained by God. Otherwise it doesn't exist. God wills everything. But if you created an uh, impure force, God says you create it, you take care of it. The analogous situation is, person goes, commits adultery, and he has an illegitimate child. And he committed adultery with the head of the community who has the purse strings to the community. And he goes and he can't support the child. So he brings his illegitimate child, the mamzer, to the head of the community who has the person, excuse me, uh, could you, could you, and he committed adultery with his wife. He says, uh, could you please uh, support this child? The man says, are you out of your mind? You created the mamzer, take care of the mamzer yourself. You come to me? Why do you have such audacity to come to me? You do something contrary to God's will and you create this contaminated spirit. You want God to sustain it? You created it. You sustain it. How does one sustain it? It has to attach itself to the person's soul. And that would be how he sustains it. It's like he compares it to a leech. A leech, it attaches itself. When, when does it detach itself? When it's fully absorbed with blood. Till then, it just sucks the blood out of the person. Or out of the, the creature. Identically, this force is, is, is so lethal, it would kill a person. God attribute of mercy says, you know, I will sustain that force, although you created it, to give you every opportunity chance to dissolve it some other way by doing tshuva. And even if you don't do tshuva, you have all this opportunity to do many other mitzvahs till the end of your life, and worse to worse, you'll, con will, you'll contend with it in, in Gehenna, it's in the spiritual location for the purging. That's what you'll do. That's how it works. But yet the Gemara says that a person who says, Omen Yeshme Rabbo, that he wants and he prays to God, that God's presence should permeate every level of existence, he's forgiven for all the sins, even without truth. How do we understand it? You have no remorse. 
you don't make a commitment not to do it again. But yet, if you say, if you, with earnestness, you want God's presence to permeate every aspect of existence, you're forgiven for all your sins. Why? So Rechaim Voloshin explains with exactly what we're speaking about. What's the basis for punishment? You create a vacuum, and within that vacuum, you have the impure force. If God permeates every aspect of existence, there's no longer there's no place for that impurity. Impurity only exists where there's a vacuum. If there's no vacuum, it's like, you know, I'll give you an example. It's known that if you have something which is growing or festering, if you cut, cut off its life source, it dies. It dies. Impurity only exists in a vacuum. If there's no vacuum, there's no oxygen. There's no oxygen, it doesn't exist. So by God permeating every level of existence, there's no vacuum. Therefore, if a person truly prays with earnestness that God should permeate every level of existence, and he means it, only God knows to what degree you mean it, all your sins are dissolved, they're vaporized. That's the understanding. If we're saying that when one studies Torah, you're engaging with God, because the Torah itself is God's names, and you're truly committed to that study, and you have the knowledge and you have the involvement, automatically the result of your sin doesn't have that same lethal value. It can't compromise you to the same degree. Because since you have that a level of attachment to God, automatically you're protected. You know, it's interesting. The Talmud tells us that there's a certain, and today they found it, you know, it's, it has to do with uh, engineering, with uh, genetic engineering, that there's certain strains of, of uh, wheat or crops that they're, they're impervious to add to certain uh, bacterial disease because they're, enge they're genetically engineered a certain way. Or even uh, insects will not go near it because it gives off a certain scent and it drives the insects away. So the Talmud says there's a certain herb that if you plant around certain crops, they're protected from any infestation because those traps ward off any of that infestation. If a person has the Torah and you're attached to that degree with God because you're that Torah sage, that automatically minimizes because it lessens the vacuum. If the vacuum is lessened, there's a lesser degree of punishment. So therefore, that's what it says. Even if a person has to go to Gehenna, but who's he going, what, what's, what's embedded in the soul? God is embedded in the soul. Automatically, even within the Gehenna, what has to be corrected is to a lesser degree. Because when he lived his life, there was less of a vacuum in his life because of the Torah that he studied. That's how I understand it. Otherwise, how do we understand it? How does the Torah protect you? I once told over a story where the Vilna Gaon's father had once come to him in a dream to communicate something to him. And it was something very important. And he said to his son, I, I was allowed to come now, but you realize I can't come that often. Only if it's the ultimate, for the ultimate reason. Why? Because when the soul descends from the heavenly location into this existence, it, ha it has to pass through many, many levels of existence. And there are all kinds of accosting angels on the way down and on the way up. And as a result of that, my soul, although he's already in the world to come, in the Garden of Eden, and at where he should be, you become exposed to what? To these, 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 these accosting spiritual forces. And the soul could actually be, could be hurt and damaged by it. Therefore, I can't come that often. I only came because I had to come. That's why. When the soul ascends, when a person dies, there are many gates it has to pass through. Famous story with the Arizal. You know, the Arizal, he was a great Kabbalist. And many, all Kabbalists, to be a Kabbalist, the basic reading is the writings of the Arizal, besides the Zohar. And the Arizal 
people were afraid to see him. They were afraid to, to allow that, him to see them. Why? Because when a person sins, one's sins are inscribed on his face. So if the Ariza would see you, he saw your whole life in front of him. He, he could read your life. He knew exactly what you did. Because everything shows on, its, on your face. In Hebrew, the word for face is ponim. Ponim. A face is a ponim. As you know, when certain people, they were younger, their people, their parents spoke Hebrew, they say, El Tashen Punim. He has a face. Ponim is a face in Hebrew. But, if he, but the word means, and to say, Pinim. Pinim means what's inside of us. The face reflects what's within us. Therefore, whatever a person is, if you could read one's face, you're able to see, you're able to read his whole life on his face. So therefore, the Arizal, being such a holy man, and having, being so connected, he was able to read a person's life on his face. And the person had a certain problem and he wanted to correct the problem and he couldn't get to the source of the problem. He go to the Arizal and he says, where did I go wrong? And he'd give him that reading and told him exactly what he has to do to correct his problem, the issue, okay? The Arizal is walking with the students, all capitalists, and he shows them, in, this is in Svas, and there's a cloud overhead, cloud, and all of a sudden the cloud totally disappears. So he says to them, I want to explain to you what that cloud is. What is that cloud? So he says in the, in the Roman era, after the destruction of the temple, there were certain Jews who were allowed to be in the Roman Senate. But to be in the Roman Senate, you have to look like a like a Roman, you know, like they used to say, when in Rome, you behave like a Roman. That's that's what the Romans say. So this Jew sitting in the Roman Senate, he had to actually shave him. And he had to have a certain type of hair, hair, hair do, so to say. His haircut had to be a certain way. He had to look like a Roman. And they had to use, a, to get that kind of shave, you have to use a razor, a straight blade. It's a Torah violation to use a straight blade. But nevertheless, this person, and he was really there to be an advocate for the Jews. He was a Jew. But factually, he could have done it differently or he could have done it less often, but he did it for the right, for the, with the right intention. Although it may have not been fully justified, but he did it, okay? And he was a good Jew. He died. And when a person ascends, you have to pass many checkpoints. You know, you used to have Checkpoint Charlie many years ago. And you, you ascend and you, 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 get, you get stopped by angels at certain checkpoints. One checkpoint is called the gate of dietary laws. And the angels there, they give you interrogation. You pass the grade, they let you go to the next, next checkpoint. And every checkpoint that you go, they ask you questions. You make the grade, they let you go further. There's a, there's a gate called Shar Hatar. It's the gate of the straight blade. They evaluate that a person violate the laws of destroying one's corners of his face using a straight blade. Did you use a cross cut? Did you use a straight blade? Comes to this gate and they ask him, he says, well, I did. I did use a straight blade. And, and his reasons weren't sufficiently justified. They said, you know something? Can't let you pass. His soul was lingering for the past 2,000 years. When you saw that cloud dissolve in the sky, his soul at this moment was just admitted to heaven. That's that what the Rizal explains to his students. You understand? That's what's going on. So, a person, before he leaves, we're not perfect, we're far from perfect. Shlomo al Salman says in Koheles, there's no tzaddik who's perfect. There's, even though there's no tzaddik who's perfect, but factually we still have to make the corrections and we have the, the means to make the corrections. You know, person, you know, there's wear and tear in one's house. You know, you rent an apartment, they take a security deposit. Why do they take a security deposit? For two reasons. Either because they're concerned you may not pay the last month's rent you're gonna move out with paying the last month's, or the apartment's gonna be damaged. So they take the security deposit 
to cover the damages that have to be fixed in the house. Okay? The walls get broken, you have to need plaster. You have plaster over the walls. You have to you have to paint the whatever it is. You understand? We're not perfect. Nobody's perfect. But even though we're not perfect, God Hashem gives us the means to correct what we failed. So if a person corrects it, even a person used the straight blade, and a person did whatever he did, it doesn't make a difference. Hashem doesn't expect you to be perfect. But at the end of the day, when you arrive, he's giving you means, he's giving you paint, he's giving you plastic, he's even giving you a contractor to put everything back in place. So the question is, why didn't you? So that's when you got they stop you off at, at the checkpoint. We gave you the means, why don't you correct it? So you never know how long they hold you up. You know, it's like you go to passport control, they say, excuse me, could you please go into, we would like to speak to you. Sometimes it takes a minute, sometimes, God forbid, a person can be held up for days. And sometimes they send you back. Everybody has their own experiences. Depends what the problem is. But I'm saying if a person has the Torah and the Torah itself, as I said, regardless of the transgression, it itself lessens the vacuum. Therefore, there's less to contend with. Less has to be atoned for. Therefore, even a person has to go to get him, if he has Torah, the Torah itself will actually minimize the degree of suffering that the person will have to suffer. The Gemara tells us that even a person is liable for the death penalty. He did something so, so egregious. He deserves the death penalty. If a person studies Torah, that could actually save him. We're talking about, we speak about spiritual excision of God. Talbot says, although we don't have a, the Sanhedrin today, but we no longer have a temple that a person is able, that the, that the court could actually issue judgments of death penalty, but there are other things in life which are the equivalent of death penalty. For instance, a person was meant to die by burning. He violated, God forbid, there's certain sins which have the carried liability of burning. What is that? God forbid a person commits adultery with his mother-in-law. God forbid the liability of death penalty is shreifah, is burning. Burning doesn't mean they, they incinerate the body. They take molten lead and they pour it down the person's throat, person, it's instantaneous death. Today, we don't have this. Not that it happened, that it could have never happened or very rarely happened. Person has this kind of liability. All of a sudden, he's bitten by a snake. The venom pulsing through his body causes him to die. That's the equivalent of the molten lead going into his body. A person was meant to die through strangulation the person will die through drowning, through smoke inhalation. That's asphyxiation. So we have the equivalent. A person has such a liability and the person studies Torah, that could avert that liability. Could avert it. Why? Now, what is the value of Torah? Not only does Torah have value to the person, it says Torah maintains this existence. As long as Torah studied, Whoever studies Torah, he contributes to the existence of existence. So why does everybody else have the opportunity to benefit from existence? Because Torah is being studied. So if you're one of the participants who's studying the Torah, I'll give you an example. You have, you have the banks of a river. They're about to overflow. And you need manpower to bring sandbags to secure the, the dike. And this person, he's a, not such a good guy. He deserves to be imprisoned, but you need his manpower to bring sandbags. Are you gonna send him to prison? You understand? We need we need him to, to participate and bring, to, to secure the dike that the, the, the community shouldn't be inundated by, by, the, by the river overflowing. A person studies Torah, he's vital to existence. Even though he has a person liabil personal liability, Hashem will extend him, not it will even credit him because everybody else is able to succeed and do good things because of his participation by what? By studying Torah. So the way God evaluates things, we have, it's like, it's mind boggling. You read biographies on Tzaddikim where it's hard to believe 
that these people, they're like, they're like angels in terms of the, 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 the kindness they do and the acts of givingness. It's not to be believed. So if this is immortal, what about God's kindness? God's chesed. Could we even fathom what God's chesed is and to what degree where his mercy touches? We have no idea. The Mara tells us, based on a verse in Tehillim, that you could have a Jew, one moment he's, God forbid, blaspheming God, and the next moment he's singing God's praises for the same, the same action. What's the case? What's, what's the story? person is going, he has a buying trip once a year, and he's going to the ship, and he's going on the sea voyage. And this is the basis for his whole year's livelihood. And he's charitable, he does great things, and he's going, and he's being driven to the port, and the wagon breaks its axle. And he's waylaid, he misses the boat. He's infuriated. God, I pray every day, I study, I give charity. What are you doing to me? And he's livid. And he comes to the dock, to the port, the ship already went out. And, you know, people, they look at him pitifully and they say, you know, something's unfortunate. And he's seething. Three weeks pass, they get the word. The ship was overtaken by pirates or the ship sank at sea. He's praising God for the same event that he was denied this opportunity. Now he realized that would have been his death. That's what it is. So can we fathom God's chesed? But one moment we see it as dread, and the next moment we say, thank God, a million times over. You know, just a few weeks ago, I told you I went, I was in a bar mitzvah in the Hamptons. So there's a certain person, not going to mention names, because it has relevance to something. So he himself, the story goes back, today his son's in college. When his son, it was his oldest son, was two and a half years old, he had a very severe case of leukemia. They themselves were to the right of reform. And they asked this person, who was a very close student of mine, who was a childhood friend of this person, could they come speak to me? They could just get a reading on it. They get a reading on it. So, um, so he asked me, could they come? I said, definitely let them come speak to me. What am I gonna tell him? I had no idea what I was gonna tell him. But I knew I would tell him something which will have value. So they come to me and they say to me, you know, we're good people and they are good people. It's their oldest child. He's two and a half years old. Does the child deserve cancer? He's in Sloan Kettering under, under chemotherapy. The parents are good people. Why? That's the question they ask me. I say, you know, the truth is I, I have no idea. I have no idea why. I said, we had a Holocaust. Six million Jews perished in the Holocaust. Do we have an answer? We have no answer. But although we have no answer, but we know God has the answer, we're not privy to many things. In life, there are many things we don't know. And then the mother started to describe the cancer, what the child's undergoing, and she says to me, I said, you know, God is the source of all kindness benevolence, everything. We, we don't have the answer. Only God knows. So how do you reconcile it? Unless you're privy, you don't know. So she says to me, you know, the truth is, thank God it's this kind of cancer which could be treated with this particular type of chemo. If it would have been other cancer, my, my son would, wouldn't have survived. Wouldn't have a chance. I said, let me ask you a question. Of course you preferred your son not to have leukemia. But could you imagine ever yourself saying, thank God it's this strain and not another, another type of leukemia? Yourself, you're saying yourself, within the context of what you have, you're saying, thank God. So you see, even when God delivers the problem, he delivers it with kindness. Because you yourself are saying, thank God. That's what I said to her. When they, when, when they heard it, they were like amazed. They were taken aback, even in terms of the way themselves, to recognize what they themselves are saying could have been worse. So they're appreciative it's not worse. That's how he touched them. So the person, 
I had a, a brand new set of books, which cost about $60. I said, it was on my bookshelf. I said, these are the laws which pertain to Shabbos. I want to give you a gift. It's a good thing to have in your house. You have time, look into the book. Look at this set of books. This good friend of him bought, bought himself, bought him a pair of tefillin, very expensive pair of tefillin, that he should start putting on tefillin, okay? I hadn't seen him in 16 years. Three weeks ago when I was at this bar mitzvah, he was there. I said to him, uh, whatever it is. So I said, how's your son? He says, thank God, he's healthy. He's on the uh, football team. He's at college and he's doing very well. So I said to him, I said, I, rem I, said, I remember our meeting like, like it was just yesterday. I said, um, I gave you a set of books. Do you look at them? He says, once in a while, it doesn't make a difference. So, but again, say, so what does this person do? He was a very successful Wall Street guy. He retired at the age of 40. He himself donated his time when, when Bloomberg was mayor. He's a genius in, in, in cyber security and also fighting terrorism. And he did, donated his time to the New York Police Department to, to head the terror uh, security, how to protect New York City from terror, right? From terrorist attacks. That's what he did. Afterwards, after his, his mayorship was up, what he does now, he works for the Jewish Federation. When they, I know it's exactly that security for synagogues and Jewish institutions to be protected from terrorism. The, the person's invisible. He doesn't want to be, he does, he's not looking for recognition. He's not paid for it. It's purely out of the goodness of salt. That's what he's doing it. He's a really good guy. Good person, but you understand. His chesed is phenomenal. Do we understand how God will repay him? We have no idea. He's not an observant Jew. He's a believing Jew, he's not observant. We don't know how to, how, to, how to evaluate anything. We know nothing. But we have to have faith and we have belief that God is, is the source of all kindness. And God pays measure for measure. So if your Torah study is part of the maintenance of existence and God wills existence because of your contribution, God's response is, we have no idea to what degree you can be compensated for that. So therefore, even a person may be deserving to die because he did something, but simultaneously, what does the person deserve because of his contribution? So therefore, study of Torah could avert many terrible tragedies because of your involvement in terms of what your contribution is. It's only we don't value what the contribution is, then we say, why should it be? It's irrelevant. It's part of the oral law. The Talmud says that a person studies it atones, it protects, it does whatever it does. And that's reality. Because that's part of our belief. As we believe in the written law, this is part of our oral tradition, what God communicated at Sinai. The Talmud tells us, that Moshe Rabbeinu asked God a number of questions. There was one question he didn't answer him. He wanted to know Tzadik Vitovlo, Tzadik Viralo. He found that Tzadik, he has an exceptionally good, and that Tzadik, he has an exceptionally bad, he suffers in this world. Russia Vitovlo, you have an evil person who lives high in the hog, doesn't have a bad day, and you have Russia Viralo, a, a bad man, it's say there's no rhyme or reason. You do good, it doesn't always play out the way you think it's going to play out. A person's evil, you find both sides of the, of the equation. Why? God didn't answer him. So the Ramchala writes, conceptually we understand why things are the way they are. But the question was, why this particular soul, not that particular soul? You know, every, every soul in, in life that comes into existence has a mission. Each mission is tailor-made to the construct of the spirituality of that soul to bring about its level of perfection. So therefore it needs different levels of challenges. One has to be, you have to be in an impoverished state. That despite your sickly state, your infirm state, your, den your denied state, you're still gonna succeed. That's your challenge. Another person, despite the 
opulence and everything you have materially, not to be distracted, to use the material as you should. So each soul, based on its spiritual makeup, needs those challenges to bring about its level of perfection. So conceptually, we understand it. But why this soul and not that soul? God says, that's, that's, pr that's privy to me, not to anyone else. Nobody else that I don't share with anyone. That's why didn't. But conceptually, you understand it. The, evil too. Certain people, because of that, they have to be a certain representation. Despite the evil, they, they're able to perpetrate more evil because of the means that they're given. Others, not. Maybe they should be, it should be a takeaway, and each person has their own takeaway for others. That's what it is. You know, we see many things in life which irk us, which upset us. There's a famous line from Rabbi Beryl Wein. He used to say, don't mix up Jews with Judaism. You say people the way they behave, and it's upsetting the behavior. You read current events, it's upsetting. Many things are upsetting. But we have the Torah. And the Torah says, you do this, you're supposed to do that. But what about these people? Look at the way they're behaving. Don't mix up Jews with Judaism. That's it. We can't get distracted. And if a person himself is on target and he's focused, but you understand, the only way you cannot be distracted, you have to be involved in the process, in the spiritualization process. The more a person is steeped in Torah study and the more he enters into Torah dialogue, when you ask questions and you go to a source which could give you that right answer, because it's emanating from that source, which is the source of everything, then you're able to keep your equilibrium. But if you're not involved in that process and you, you become God's been unbalanced, you become unbalanced, it's, it's, it's inevitable you're gonna fall on your face, God forbid, or fall on your head, one or the other. Therefore, you have to be involved in the process. We say, it's our life, it's the length of our days. Just as life, blood pulsating through your body is the source of your life, the Torah pulsating through our minds, our emotion, and being touched, being spiritualized, that's also, that allows us to maintain ourselves in the physical existence, despite many things which are overwhelming, discouraging, and upsetting, does make a difference. It allows us to be anchored and be tethered in a way that the these gale winds and force winds don't blow us away into God.